Welcome to our May All Books Considered Book Club meeting. I'm Bill Nimitz, your host. And this evening, we are joined by author Jennifer Penny Boylan, who co-authored our May selection, which, as you all know, is Mad Honey. I cannot wait to get into this book, and I'm sure all of you feel the same way. Boy, do I have a lot of questions. But first, as always, we have a few housekeeping details to, to address. A huge thank you to Bull Moose and Coffee by Design for their generous support of this club. Without organizations like these, events like this just wouldn't be possible. Thank you both. And I'd also like to recognize our bookstore partners, in addition to Bull Moose, where many of you secured your copy of Mad Honey, thanks to Bookstacks in Bucksport, None Such Books and More in South Portland, Mockingbird Bookshop in Bath, Sherman's Maine, Coast Bookshops, DDG Booksellers in Farmington, Left Bank Books in Belfast, and Print in Portland. I'd also like to congratulate Book Club and Maine Public members, listen up now, Rosemary D, Deirdre B, Samuel M, Francesca G, and Judy H, who were randomly selected to win a copy of Mad Honey, which is signed by Jennifer. I have a, uh, if you have a question during our conversation tonight, send it over to us at fun at mainpublic.org, and I'll try to work it into our conversation. We're going to get started, but I'm going to begin first with a spoiler alert. We'll be talking about Mad Honey with the assumption that each of you has read it. There are things in there that, as you know now, if you read it, will surprise you. And if you haven't read Mad Honey yet, we strongly suggest that you do so and then watch this book hub meeting. It will be archived on mainpublic.org and on Maine Public's YouTube channel. Uh, so you have been forewarned. <laughs> Jenny, welcome. It's great to have you. Hi, Bill. It's what a delight to be here. Uh, we can't wait. Uh, you know, I started reading this book, and of course, people are always asking, uh, you know, what's this book about? You're reading Mad Honey. Oh, Mad Honey, what's that about? So I, I found myself with so many answers. I'd say it's about love, it's about hate, it's about beauty, it's about ugliness, it's about parenthood, adolescence, loss, domestic violence, being transgender, the criminal justice system, the meaning of home. And then I say, it's, it's about New Hampshire. So, so tell us, <laughs> in your words, what, what, is, what is this book about from, from your perspective? Well, let's see. Um, Mad Honey begins with the story of Olivia McAfee, um, who uh, is a beekeeper. Uh, she has fled an abusive marriage, uh, and she has settled in a small town in New Hampshire. Although, kind of just between the the two of us and everyone listening, it's really Maine because <laughs> you know. But it's it, it it's a small town in New Hampshire. It'll seem, I hope, very familiar to Maine readers. Um, and she is there with her son Asher, uh, trying to trying to start over. And um, but she still bears uh, the, the shadow of the abuse that she suffered at the hands of her now ex husband. And she worries about her son Asher too, who um, was a child when she uh, fled her marriage. Asher is now uh, a senior in high school and he has fallen head over heels in love with the new girl, Lily, who is also just arrived in town. And she too is starting over uh, with her mother who is named Ava and she is a forest ranger uh, in the White Mountains. It's worth mentioning that uh, Olivia is also a beekeeper and she is uh, got a whole thing going on with her hives and the bees and the honey that she sells. Well. One day she gets a call from the local police. Lily is dead and Asher is the chief suspect, making Olivia having to ask herself, how well does she know her son? And is the past ever really the past? That's where we begin. Yeah. Ah. Now you say we, and, and you mean that literally, uh, the, the, as a, as a as a longtime journalist, there were occasions when I had to uh, co-write a story. You know, you see the double bylines at the top of the story, and, and that's uh, always been an interesting process. Uh, if you're 
usually it was one person, both people maybe did the reporting and one person did the writing primarily or some something like that. In this case, this was truly a co-authoring project. And those of us who kept going because we didn't want to stop reading and got into the author's notes uh, saw exactly how that transpired. It began with a dream. It began with a dream. Uh, this is this is a true story. It was six years ago, right around now, actually. It was early May. Uh, and I was actually in New York City, where I teach uh, at Barnard College, which is the women's college of Columbia University. Uh, end of the semester, I woke from a dream. And the dream was that I was co-authoring a book with Jody Pico. And what was the dream? The dream was two voices. It was the voice of a young girl. Well, she was, she was about 18, Lily, who had been murdered. And uh, the other voice was the voice of her, um, her, her boyfriend's mother. Very much the plot I just told you. Um, mm -hmm. The mother of the, of the boy who is accused of the murder. It was these two voices. And I, that was really the story. I woke up from that dream thinking... You know, that that's really very specific. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I should also mention, Jodi Picot was, is an author. I, I, I read her. I loved her. In fact, I was in a book club 20 years ago, over 20 years ago, in which we read one of her, her books. Uh, the Pact was the first Jodi Picot book I ever read. And but so you, but you had never met. You had never had, met. We never met. Uh, we followed each other on Twitter. There's. There's something called author Twitter, or there was. There used to be um, authors on Twitter would kind of follow each other just to pay attention to what was going on, and also just to see what was going on in in the book world. Anyway, so I knew I knew of Jody, but I never met her, never talked to her. Anyway, I went on Twitter that morning, and I tweeted out, "I just dreamed I was co-authoring a book with Jody Pico." <laughs> and about thirty seconds later, I got a direct message from Jody Pico, who said, Jenny Boylan, what was this book about? So I told her what I just told you. And her response, and I quote, was, OMG, let's do it. Wow. So wow. It's, it, it sounds, it, it wasn't quite that simple, because then we had to, I think my first response to her was, great, we have everything except the plot. <laughs> Some of the issues in Mad Honey, uh, which I guess we'll talk about pretty soon. Um, sure. Spoilers coming, yeah. folks. But some of the issues in Mad Honey are issues that she was thinking, uh, were issues that she wanted to write about in the, in the, in the near future. But she wasn't quite sure how to go about it. And um, lo and behold, there I was in her inbox. And mm -hmm. I think she thought, well, if I co-author with Jenny, I'll have the authority to uh, do a deep dive into these uh, into these issues. Anyway, so. We figured this was 2017, and we were both involved in other books at the time. Uh, but we said, I'll tell you what, maybe maybe uh, fall of 2020, we'll, we'll clear some time and see if we can plan this out together. So time went by, and suddenly it was March of 2020, and I got an email, or maybe I sent one to her, but the message was, I don't know about you, but I suddenly have all this free time I wasn't expecting. As both of our everything we had you know with the pandemic everything that, that we had sure. planned was suddenly canceled so we spent about six weeks um putting together the the bible the storyboard of, of the mm -hmm. of the of the book and then we wrote it that summer and into the fall the trick with mad honey um is it okay if i keep going the trick the trick okay. about the book i, I would want to say i just want to point one I want to point one thing out, though. You yeah. said you put together yeah. a storyboard, but as you wrote in your notes, uh, that storyboard took over your house, correct? I mean, you had... You it had did. I have a wonderful photograph of, room room. of just um, the, the whole living room of, of this just great, all these pieces of paper. Because, so here's the trick. Um, there's two voices. Lily is the young woman, and uh, the mom is Olivia. And the, the book begins on the day that Lily is found murdered. That's chapter one. So that's not a spoiler. Right. So the Olivia chapters, every other chapter, which Jody wrote mostly, take us forward through the arrest and the trial. 
the Lily chapters go backwards in time because of course she's dead after chapter one. Right. So my the first the second Lily chapter is a week before her death, and then the, the next Lily chapter is two weeks before. And we go all the way back until the first week of September when she and her mom first arrived in this town. That's right. So now it was you, really you, very tricky. You 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 struggled. Sorry. I, I struggle, but in your note, you, you mentioned that uh, at times it appeared that, that you may have found that a little daunting to be writing backwards in time as opposed to the typical. Yeah, that was Jody's narrative. idea for me. <laughs> I mean, she mm -hmm. she said that she had done it before. Um, uh, was it um, 19 minutes? It was one of her books. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's 19 minutes goes backwards in time. And she said to me, well, you know, I've done that once and I swore I would never do it again. So this time, Jenny, it's your it's your job. So, um, I mean, the trick is the storyboard. Anyway, I wrote out um, from September to December. That's that's for her story. Sure. I figured yeah. out what happens in each of those ten chapters. Then I, excuse me. In each of those chapters, there's ten flashbacks to a time before she that's arrives right. in town, going all the way back to when she's um, six years old. Yeah, a little eager. Yeah. So I put a flashback in each one of those chapters. Then I cut the whole thing apart with scissors and, and taped it, put the whole thing in going backwards. And that's wow. when we had the story. And then we had to make sure that what happened at the end of one of the Lily chapters would then kind of dovetail into what was happening yes. with the Olivia chapters. So yeah. that's and how we wrote it, that I would write a chapter and send it to her. I'd email it to, to Jody and she would write she would then edit that chapter, send it back to me along with her next chapter. Oh, I would edit okay. her so you, chapter. So it was back and ah, forth. And so you, did it, other, you and did it sequentially that way. We, we did it um, sequentially within, within the book, starting with chapter one and going sure, forward. Sure. Yeah. But we, yeah. we had to, um, in the, we didn't want to make the book sound too much like it was two authors kind of fighting. I mean, in the end, the, I think the, the voice of the book even though it's two different characters, I hope the voices sound unified and like it's very much um, one, yes, I, one I, I, narrative. I found it that way. Oh, one other trick we we and there was one other trick that when when we first agreed to do this, I said, okay, but you have to write one of the Lily chapters, and I'm going to write one of the Olivia chapters. Just um, well, for two reasons. One, I thought it was a good authorial. It was like you know, good practice for each of us to inhabit the other character at least once. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is I wanted it to, we wanted it to be kind of a fun challenge for readers to figure out which sure. one of the which one of the Lily chapters is Jody's and well, which one I, of the I, Lily do when I read theory? that I thought I thought, oh I started going back and and honestly I had a tough time uh, figuring out which was which and I'm sure people guess all the time trying to figure out uh, who wrote yeah, what, but. People do, I, I think the one that I wrote is easier to figure out than the one that she wrote, but I don't know, I shot, I can, I, maybe I, I can I say think, that at the yeah. end of the. Well, I think it's the one in which there's a, there's a, there's a soliloquy, if you will, about being transgender and what transgender means. I assume that's the one you wrote, is that right? Or. Uh, yeah, that's, so that, there's a yeah. transgender woman who runs a music shop. Uh, yes, that's And she's Elizabeth. kind of Elizabeth. explaining that's to right. Olivia. Yeah, Liz, she's, she's explaining what, what her, what the issues are and you know right. that was that was a really important chapter in some ways that's the most important chapter even though it's kind of a a sidebar but what we really wanted in this book is i think transgender issues have become so gnarly now um that it's hard to forget that, that people are not issues people are individuals people are human beings trying to live their lives and you know, when we talk about transgender people, it's funny, when I came out as trans 20, almost 25 years ago, everybody, at least in my little town in Maine, was very nice to me. Nobody had been taught they were supposed to hate me. Nobody started mm -hmm. yelling at me about, you know, sports or, um, uh, you know, uh, hormones for children. I mean, sure. when people saw me, they saw, you know, the person that they had always known, the person who was the parent of two children in the local school system, the person who'd been on the, the, the PTA. And um, I, I can tell you, I have never had, well, almost never had any issue in 
in my hometown in Maine um, or anywhere else in the state of Maine. People have treated me with generosity and grace because I think they understand, again, I am not an issue. I'm just a human being. Mm -hmm. That's what we wanted that scene with Lizzie uh, to stand in for because people don't know how to have these conversations. People don't know, I mean, people are kind of walking on eggshells. Some, there are some people who are just afraid to say the wrong thing, afraid to not to know what questions to ask. So we really kind of walk people through Transgender 101. I should yeah. say, the book is not only, I and mean, it's not a book about transgender issues, that, that there's no, a major there's, trans element in the story. There's that thread. But, um, and, and I love Elizabeth, I loved, uh, Elizabeth's line, in fact, when she's discussing that, where she says, uh, I think she's, she's speaking to Lily, I believe, and she says, w w when you meet one trans person, you, I'll paraphrase, but you've met one trans person. And when you've uh, met one trans, if you've met one transgender person, you've met one transgender person. One transgender person. Uh, and the simplicity of that line resonated throughout the whole book. Uh, well, we're going to, uh, before we uh, even approach running out of time, let's talk about Lily. And uh, let's talk about, let's talk about Lily. Your, your development of that character and your timing, which we will get to. Uh, in terms of the the reveal, uh, tell tell us why. Uh, yeah, so, we'll, so, we'll, we'll, we'll just cut to it. Halfway through the book, uh, it is revealed that Lily is transgender, and it's it's a shocking, dramatic courtroom scene. Uh, catches everyone in the courtroom, prosecution, defense, everyone by surprise. Uh, yet we are about almost exactly halfway through the book at that point. So you clearly made a decision that there was a a right moment. To reveal that, why that deep into the book? We wanted people to get to know and fall in love with Lily first, to see her as this. I mean, she's not a typical young woman, but she's certainly a very appealing young woman, and she's not defined by being trans. You will see in her. I mean, the thing about Lily, she's so much fun. She's she is. Um, She's just full of beans. She, mm -hmm. she, she, um, so she's um, 18 years old. She plays the cello. Uh, she's a bit of a nerd. She loves classical music. She plays the cello. Um, she's a fencer in the, um, uh, the high school fencing team. Um, she, uh, she, she's, she's, a she's, a fencer. She, she's a fencer who screams too. <laughs> yes, she I has mean, a she... thing, it's called a flesh. And That's right. As yeah. she she has a particular attack uh, that that freaks people out, and and um, that's one of her signature moves. Mm -hmm. And how did I learn about fencing? I learned it when my children were on the fencing team at Kent Hill School in uh, beautiful Kent Hill, Maine. Uh, I didn't know anything that. about fencing until I was a parent watching my kids learn how to do that. So anyway, Lily is just she's and she's a sponge. She's so curious about the world. She is thirsty. And she has this just wonderful spirit. Um, I think it's hard not to fall in love with her. At least I hope you fall in love with her. Yeah, so definitely. when you get to the end of chapter one and she's gone, there's a, I, there's a real sense of loss, I think. There's certainly a sense of loss for me as a writer. So how fortunate in a way that you get to go back in time and get to know her more and get to know her story. And I, mm -hmm. we reveal the fact that she's trans a good, well, it's almost the halfway point of the book because uh, to some degree it figures into the legal drama in that sure. once we learn that she's trans, the question is, was she killed because she was trans? Did her boyfriend know she was trans? Is that part of, is it, you know, it's a, a not unfamiliar, unfortunately, scenario in which young transgender women are killed because men yeah. feel that they've been bamboozled or something. Yeah. Um, well, well, that brings us to Asher. We also wanted that brings us to Asher, and he, uh, when when his uncle Jordan is uh, is you know planning his defense, he's 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 just adamant that the only possible defense here is that Asher didn't know. Therefore, you remove that motive uh, for the prosecution. Asher, on the other hand, obviously he did know. 
we 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 learn that about that we find that at the really the toward the end that Asher did yeah. know, and he's proud that he is proud exactly. that he knew and exactly made, and it's yeah. not not that it it's not that it made no difference to him because it did make a difference when he first learned and he learns. Um, he's learned after they've slept together for the first time. Right. I mean, he didn't know the difference. Mm -hmm. um, and after, and then Lily feels bad at having not revealed herself to him, so she does. And that freaks him out for a few chapters. Um, but Asher comes around and he realizes, you know, this is the person that I love. It doesn't make a difference. And um, so in some ways, it makes us kind of fall in love with Asher and his kindness right. and his wisdom and his spirit but at the same time it also kind of screws him legally because now that now that when it comes out in court that he did know uh that makes it look much worse for him um as, right. as a possible motive for, for this yeah, it for this quickly derail, derails the defense uh that had been planned in, at that indeed point. You know, uh, yeah. I want to talk a little bit about some of the world in which Asher and Lily traveled, because uh, I'm not sure I, I suspect that this was purposeful, but uh, I'm halfway through this book. And, and I think it's the scene where Asher's friend, Dirk, the hockey goalie, is at the party. And it, I think it might be the first time he actually gets physical, uh, not in a not in a sexual sense, but actually in a potentially violent sense uh, with Lily, where he grabs her and. Uh, and I saw that, and then I there were a couple other clues along. So I'm cruising along through this book, thinking I got this figured out. Dirk did it. Dirk did it. <laughs> and, and Dirk did it. Then yeah, it's got to be Dirk. You know, he was at the house before Asher. Uh, something happened. Was that deliberate? I mean, were, were you trying to lay that trait, or were you and, and Jody well, trying? Well, we to have to. We have to. Um, I mean, I think the, the 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 question. One of the questions of the book is. How well do we know the people we love? It's a question that Olivia, Asher's mom, has to ask about her son because she knows that Asher's father was violent. Um, right. And uh, so is this something that Asher has seen and learned? Um, she wonders about herself, that she, does she bear the scars of what she's been through? Um, Lily has to wonder, is the past really the past? Did she, I mean, she, she was trans, she went through transition and now, um, um, you know, and she, this is, this is a, a kind of a, a charged word, but she passes. Um, you would generally not know. Asher can't tell that she's trans um, when, mm -hmm. you know, when they first sleep together. Um, so uh, you have to wonder can we, how well do we, how, how well do we know the people we love? Mm -hmm. And it was important. We want people to be really wondering about Asher. Did he do it? Because it's, I mean, we see him being really violent with, with her that's right. now and again, he does have a temper. So um, that's a possibility. And we have, and and we there have, other possibilities. We have Olivia wondering to in her innermost self that herself having, Having gone through what she did with uh, with her ex husband, having knowing that for start for one thing as a young child, Asher witnessed some of that, and then there's that whole question of what was passed on and and what wasn't. So it really leads to moments of uh, excruciating uh, doubt, perhaps in in Olivia's mind. Right, and we also have we also have Lily's father. Um, uh, early in the book, whom we see around the time of the murder, he was also in town. He no longer he he lives on the west coast, but he has come as a surprise to uh, perhaps try to get to know his child again. So and and um, Lily's father is uh, n n not a good guy. Um, oh, that kitchen! That scene in the kitchen uh, is just just brutal. When, when That's the very, the very end of the, the very end of the book. The very last flashback yeah. it goes all the way back to when Lily was, who as a child was named Liam, uh, and the father is just will not have this transgender BS. That he um, he cuts Lily's hair. Um, he's a tie, he ties her to a chair, and he's and I think in some ways the most heartbreaking line in the book is when he says. He says to his child, I am not a bad person. 
And I think a lot of people who um, hate people like me, a lot of people who have no room in their hearts for people like me and people like Lily would say that about themselves. I'm not a bad person. And uh, I wanted to put, uh, Lily's father is not a villain in that sense. He's, but he is someone who cannot see his child. And mm -hmm. I, sometimes I think that the main thing you need to understand transgender people is imagination. It's, it's very hard if, you, if, you, if you've never felt what transgender people feel. And the thing that I felt in my life from when I was six years old, the certainty of who you are, if, if, you, if, you, if you don't know what it's like for someone to feel what I felt, you can think, well, look, look, kid, you're, you're not a girl, so just get over it. Snap out of it. Just make the best of it. And this is the kind of thing you, can say, you would say if, you're, if you are not making the effort to really know the, the burden that transgender people can carry and the joy with which we are filled when we finally get to be ourselves. It's like, mm -hmm. uh, I would compare it to a sense of homesickness for a place you've never been. But when mm -hmm. you step on those shores, you feel, yes, I'm home. And yeah. you feel nor normal in a way. Mm -hmm. You feel the thing that everybody else gets to feel all the time, but never has to question it. So that's what mm -hmm. Lily's father lacks. It's he lacks a moral imagination. And I think, quite frankly, that's what people who have, who cannot make room in their hearts for people who are trans, of whom, by the way, there are tens of thousands in the state of Maine, mm -hmm. people trying to go about their lives, people who they, they, you know, their concern is not so much to interfere with anybody else's life. We just want to be left alone. And... Exactly. It seems like a very small thing to ask, but in fact, it's yeah. it's the whole world. Is is uh, is Lily's father when he shows up at the funeral and is summarily uh, run out of the place? Pretty much, uh, is he? What is he seeking there? Is he seeking uh, forgiveness? Is he seeking redemption? Is he seeking um, reconciliation? Uh, I think again, he wants to be seen. He wants people. I think he wants to. Um, I don't think he wants to be forgiven for um, for having refused to see Lily for who she is. I think he wants to be for, he wants people to think of him as um, perfectly justified in everything mm -hmm. he's done, in all the ways in which he refused to to allow Lily to live as herself. Mm -hmm. And I, in a way, I wanted him to if 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 Lizzie, the transgender woman who is in the music store, stands in for kind of trans one hundred and one. Uh, Lily's father is kind of standing in for all the people who would say, you know, um, uh, you, you you are who you are, and you you cannot change. Right. Uh, yeah. what your, I, whatever your heart, whatever if, if your heart says that you are something other than you appear to be, um, that's too bad. No, I so was that's, I think that's the rule. I was talking to someone I know about Lily uh, recently and uh, try, again, trying to explain what the book's about and uh, without revealing uh, too much in the hopes that this person would read it. But when we got to the whole issue of, uh, of, of being transgender, uh, and I think I used Elizabeth's line about if you've met one, you've met one. Uh, and I got that response. It was, uh, I think it was a very simple, but and this is a very religious person and said, but what about the Bible? And, and I thought, okay, so this is someone who is so locked in that formula, whatever it is, that, 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 that creationist view of the world. Well, I mean, this is, this is, a, this is a bit of a, yeah. of a, of a tangent, but, but I would, I'll, I can answer that question. Yeah, First sure. of all, I, I am a Christian. Um, I am a member of a very large church um both in new york city and a very small church in um in maine in in uh at old south church in uh in hallowell maine um oh yeah and the bible tells us a lot of things i mean the bible does does specifically say uh um 
There are eunuchs who have chosen to be eunuchs. There are eunuchs who have been um, rendered eunuchs by others. But let all who can accept them who can. Let all who can accept them who can. And so we're, we're told um, that, I mean, there have been transgender people as long as there have been people. This is not something new. The mm -hmm. Bible tells us a lot of things. Another thing the Bible tells us is um, the, you know, the, the new commandment, the new covenant, love each other as I have loved you. It doesn't need to be more complex than that. Yep. And I would say, you know, if you if you're thinking, well, God doesn't make mistakes, I'm, you know, a lot of the people who say God doesn't make mistakes, they wear glasses. <laughs> so it's I guess it's OK. It's OK to correct your vision. A lot of the people yeah. who would say um, God doesn't make mistakes have hearing aids. Some of the mm -hmm. people who would say that have had heart transplants. Mm -hmm. We we have been given the wisdom by God to become the people that we are commanded to be. And I feel like mm -hmm. I'm here in part because I had to live up to the challenge that God set me. God said, this is what I need from you. And I was like, seriously, you need me to be a woman? Couldn't I, have, couldn't I be a rock star instead? <laughs> But I'm also here as a challenge to others to ask them, how loving can you be when Jesus said, love one another as I have loved you? Mm -hmm. we, I mean, we don't go to heaven because we love people who are easy to love. We go to heaven sure. because we love people who are difficult to love. And who is more difficult to love than someone whose sense of the world is profoundly different from our own? I'm going to shift gears on you. Let's talk about the bees. Okay. Shifting. <laughs> We're talking the, uh, about bees. Uh, well, one reader asked uh, if, if you are, uh, it was a very nice way. To, why did you decide that beekeeping would be the glue or the honey that held the story together? Asked they, the person asked if you keep bees. I, it sounds like in the notes that you uh, explained that you learned to keep bees is probably part of your process in writing this well, book. Well, actually... Jo Jody was uh, Olivia is the beekeeper, and so that's real. Oh, that that's was right. That's right. I'm sorry. It was Jody's story. notes. Yeah. Um, yeah. But but Jody, yeah, Jody spent a, a, the the summer we were writing the book, uh, kind of as a guest beekeeper at, at a at a uh, what is it called an apiary um, yes. near near yes. her house in, in New Hampshire. But, but, um, why bees? But, because but I love about, it's about yeah. But she digresses about, at times into the bee world, and the parallels are so striking between what's happening among the bees and what's happening in human society. Uh, what, what prompted her to choose bees as, as that vehicle? Well, let's see. For one thing, bees, it, it is a matriarchy. There is a queen bee. And every, the, everyone who does anything in a beehive is, is female. There are male bees. They're called drones. They don't really do anything. They lie around pretty much all day. Um, but an interesting thing happens that when uh, when the queen uh, gets old, uh, sometimes the uh, other bees uh, decide it's time to make a new queen. So they make this stuff called royal jelly, and they put royal jelly in the um, in the cells where the uh, uh, bees are developing. If uh, a worker bee, that's a female bee, gets the royal jelly, that worker bee becomes a queen becomes a new queen. But this is the interesting thing. If a drone, that's a male bee, gets the royal jelly, that male bee becomes a queen and becomes female. And so I think that's a very interesting thing. Also, bees are a community. They really, they work as a community and they look out for each other. So mm -hmm. you can see there are a lot of things in in that B world that are a really interesting analogy to what's happening uh, yeah, with Lily yeah. and the people around her. Including the name of the book, The Mad Honey, which is an, a thing, which I, I learned mm -hmm. uh, that mad honey uh, can, can lead to all kinds of calamity. Uh, within yeah, mad honey is a real thing. So so um, uh, mm -hmm. honey is, is made as a result of bees um, pollinating uh, uh, flowers and they bring that, they bring, um, bring it back to 
to the hive where the hive honey gets made. Um, and um, if there's a particular flower in Nepal where if they go and get the, the pollen from that flower, it becomes, um, it, it can be poison. If you have enough of it, it can actually kill you. But if you, but, but short of that, it can um, make you sick. It can make you hallucinate. It was actually even used uh, by the Romans as a kind of biological warfare. They would put vats of this mad honey by the road when there was an invading army coming in and soldiers, always hungry, would stop, eat the mad honey and they would get sick. And then the Roman soldiers could come in and attack them. So it's, it's a real thing. It's very trippy. I've never had it. <laughs> um, people keep saying well, I should I should try it, but I'm like you know sure. I, yeah. I I'd rather write about it than than, than do it. <laughs> well, when you speak about that, and there's one connection that I made at least, and someone else, I'm going to read a reader's question here because it goes right to this. It's, and it, and it, it kind of talks about uh, if you take the metaphor of mad honey and apply it to this small community of Adams, New Hampshire. Uh, this this reader writes when Asher is arrested and accused of Lily's murder, the court of public opinion convicted him before his trial even began. Uh, why do you think this has become so common in the United States today? And why was this important to the story to show that that ostracization of uh, Asher and Olivia and uh, once he was in that system, whether he was in jail or back home, uh, the community basically just, they, they had him convicted long before the trial yeah well this is not a new thing of course but um we've reached a point in the world especially with social media where people believe things that are not true we've all seen what's happened with the fox news and dominion uh, uh mm -hmm. voting machines uh case over the last month we know that people are being led to believe things that are not true and what's interesting to me is even when presented with the facts that sometimes people are reluctant to let go of the thing that they've been told or that they believed that is really not true. So I think to some degree, there's an analogy to what people think about transgender people, people like me, um, who really, um, in so many ways, were, were convicted I don't want to say convicted, but people people believe things about us that are not true before they've even met us, and um, so I more think an, that's another more of an indictment. Say. An indictment, you might say. Yeah, yeah. Where they they yeah. are going to let's. Uh, there's one person, and and when we talk about the criminal justice system in this story, I'm fascinated by the detective. Uh, I'm sorry. Oh, the, Mike, Detective Mike Newcomb. Yeah, right. Yeah, Mike goes i mean he 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 has so many different uh, i won't say personas but uh he's coming from so many different places in this book because at, at very first he's an old call an old high school friend of olivia's and then he's the lead investigator in this case and he's the one who actually uh takes asher into custody and then he turns more sympathetic again and he becomes much uh, much more sympathetic uh of olivia and I was fascinated by the evolution of his character throughout this whole thing, right up to and including the point where he and Olivia uh, become star-crossed lovers uh, at yeah, the end. Um, so and I know there's a story behind really... that because you and Jordy were fighting over him, I understand. <laughs> Who gets him? Yeah, we did. We That was, that was the only disagreement we really had uh, in the book. I, I thought that the very end that Detective Mike should end up going out with um, Lily's mother, whose name is Ava, the forest ranger. With Ava, yeah. Um, and I, I really had high hopes. And Ava, you know, again, now Ava, um, uh, she's she's divorced. She had to leave Lily's father because Lily was Lily's father was so cruel to his child. Um, so she's um, living by herself, and she's a forest ranger, um, and, or she works for the Forest Service, and. Mm -hmm. um, she, she has kind of given up her whole life to protect her child. And by the way, this is a very real thing. And uh, those of you who know uh, the actress, Nicole Mains, might recognize I know, I know her, yeah. who's a great- I wrote about, I wrote about yeah, her many um, times. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. So Nicole, who's now, by the way, starring in the new, um, uh, the new uh, series, Yellow Jackets. I saw her on TV the other night. I said, oh my God, I knew her when she was nine years old. <laughs> 
Um, yeah. Nicole grew up in Maine and uh, her um, parents uh, had to keep moving her from school system to school system because when it came out that she was trans, uh, people came for her. And That's so, right. um, uh, but um, Ava, Lily's or, mom, not, is only, not, not, as only did they, as, not only did they come for her, but in some cases they sent their children after her. I know of one instance in which yeah, uh, they did the custodial, custodial so, grandparent did that. And, and I mean, it's, 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 it blew my mind then, it blows my mind now that someone would do that. Well, Ava, Ava is not as lucky as Nicole Maines was in her, um, with her parents and Ava with her um, family. So um, Ava is single. And I was thinking, what a nice gift to give her a boyfriend. Nice detective, Mike. Well, <laughs> Jody Picot was not having that. She said, Jenny Boylan, he's mine. Blah, ha, ha. And she <laughs> ended up giving him to Olivia. And we, I was really like, oh, come on, let's give Ava a break. Well, uh, in the end, in the end, as in most cases, Jody, Jody, this is what I say. In the end, we compromised, and Jody got her way. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, well, you know, and, um, I, I felt the other so, nice thing about Detective. Uh, sorry, go ahead. No, well, I, I we'll go. No, go ahead. I want to hear more about Mike. Oh, I was just going to say. The, the, so he was like almost exclusively um, uh, Jody's character, but then there's one scene I, I found myself towards the end of the book, which is actually early in the chronology going forward in time in remembering the lily chapters go backwards in time sure uh, when she's new in town yes, uh, yes which again occurs toward the late book she gets she gets lost in in her in adams and she goes down the wrong street and she's now experiencing what it's like to be a woman alone uh and she hears someone's footsteps coming behind her and it's a bad part of town and she gets really scared the way and i think yes. every woman reading this book is going to know what that's like what it's like to suddenly be afraid uh yeah. with footsteps behind you and at the last second up comes to, uh, a car pulls over it's detective mike and he says who are you get in the car let me help you so that was the one time i suddenly thought I get to write a, a scene with Jody's character, and I wasn't really planning on that, but suddenly there yeah, it was, was a very tense and, um, moment I, outside outside the Shay of all places, the the, the bar, the, the dive but bar. Did I call it the Shay? You did. did. I call it the Shay? Yeah, because yeah. you know, that's yeah. a that's a, a, a it's a dive bar in that's still. In, I, in, I'm sorry, it's in not a dive bar. In it's Waterville, a, it's correct? a it's a it's a it's a it's a wonderfully sketchy place. It's in Waterville. I was in, I used to be in a band that played in the. All throughout central maine and we played the shay back in the day yep. it was a great place to play but it's not a place and it's not a, it's not a, it's uh you know it's the south end of waterville it's not a place where i would wander around um if i didn't know where i was or where i was going exactly First, exactly i mean i wouldn't well let's talk about the sense of place here because i was struck by uh in as you said, this is set in New Hampshire, but it may as well it's up in Coas County. It might as well be Maine. I mean, the, the similarities are so overwhelming. But yeah, there yeah. are there are so many uh, place names that are real. I kept checking, and I, yeah, I, I thought I'd heard of that place. So it's it's replete with reference points around New Hampshire. Uh, I couldn't find Adams. Does is there a town of Adams in New Hampshire, or is that a fictional? No, name? I, I needed to make it. Um... Uh, a, a fictional town. Um, it's near. So there, there are, um, New Hampshire gave us, um, I think, two presidents. Uh, but um, one of them was, excuse me, poor old Franklin Pierce, mm -hmm. who I'm sure, as you remember, Franklin Pierce was our 14th president, um, preceding James Buchanan, who preceded Abraham Lincoln. He's not remembered as particularly good president. In fact, he was one of those kind of terrible four or five presidents leading up to the Civil War who just kind of let the country fall apart. Um, so this, this is a town that has um, some association with um, Franklin Pierce. There's a statue of him in town. Yes, right. And I think they call it President Square. But no, there's not an Adams. We wanted, I wanted it to be fictional enough so that we could invent, invent things. Sure. I, sure. I think it, it probably feels... Account except for for Franklin Pierce and President Square it's it, I, for me it felt a lot like Waterville um yeah. just in that yeah. Waterville and not actually not Waterville as it is now Waterville which has as you as you all know is in the process 
of doing this transformation, which is either yes. wonderful or painful or both, depending on who you ask. It's, it's a big um, change. I was, there, I was there myself. It's, 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 it's Waterville, it's Waterville 19, 1989. Um, yeah. Or yeah. maybe 19, it's like after the, after the mills have closed, but before the future has really become clear. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a good little town on a river where there used to be log drives. Um, and uh, it's, you know, it's full of people who, there's a, there's a French part of town down by the yeah. water. Um, so I think it'll, I think Adams will feel very familiar to yeah. um, anybody who's, you know, lives in one of those, any town along the Kennebec. Hey, we only have time for a couple of more questions. And there's one that I've been uh, denying to ask because in, again, I'll refer to your notes, but you mentioned, and it's, it's heartbreaking, the, the final scene in the book where everything has played out. Uh, Asher has been uh, uh, acquitted uh, to get on and getting all exonerated. Time. Yes. Yeah. Exonerated. And, uh, and Maya surprisingly turns out to be uh, not the villain, but certainly the, the, the person who, uh, who, who was responsible for what happened to uh, was involved in what happened to Lily. And Ava comes to Olivia's house and she's she's leaving and she's off to hike the appalachian trail in in your note which is the dream and which lily always wanted her to do and in your notes you talked about uh wanting to write a sequel uh, about ava uh and uh, apparently you you feel like it would be very difficult to do without jody but but what it what it impressed upon me is how uh how real these characters became to you and how, how you, it, so, it seems just as I was having, I, I was regretting re reaching the end of the book. I, I hear that you had trouble saying goodbye to these characters. Is that, is that right? Well, yeah. I mean, for all kinds of reasons. Um, for one thing, Lily, there's a lot of me in Lily. Um, if I had been able to go through transition when I was younger, if I'd been lucky enough to, as Lily goes through transition, um, when she's when she's a teenager, and um, it has a you know, full medical transition by the time she's eighteen. So I mean, in some ways, she gets to live the life that I wish I. I mean, I didn't come out until I was practically forty. Um, so I mean, also I'm I'm a nerd. I'm a know-it-all. I don't play the cello, but I'm certainly a musician. My children were fencers. So so you know, th there's a lot of Lily in me, and the sure. fact that she. Um, met this fate is really heartbreaking. Now she, again, she didn't, and this is an important point, she doesn't die because she's trans, although certainly many trans women do. But mm -hmm. she she dies really as an act of jealousy of Maya because she was, a, just another girl was jealous of her. She was too much of a woman in some ways. Yeah, which was um, one of the best kept secrets in the book, uh, that Maya, that this, this, Supposedly, uh, brother sister oh, I'm relationship. Glad you didn't see that I, 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 was, I did not. I kept. I did not. I was um, okay. I'm glad. I, I kept saying to Jody, "We should hide that better." And Jody was like, "Ah, don't worry about it, Jenny." Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, it was hard to say goodbye to her. And it's also true that there are. Um, it, it takes place in a part of the world that's very. Um, familiar to me and that I love very deeply. And so writing about this little town was really very much like, in some ways, was kind of like getting to spend more time in Maine, um, which now for four or five months of the year, now I'm, I'm, I'm not in Maine, I'm, I'm in New York City teaching at uh, Columbia University, which is a wonderful job. But um, I mean, I can't say I always regret missing February and March, <laughs> but um i i when yeah. i came when i came when when my wife and i came to to maine uh 35 years ago we found in some ways for the first time a place that really felt like home and so just right this the book also made me more a little homesick uh both both for a place as well as for this person um so yeah it was hard it was hard to mm. it's all if you love your characters it's always hard to end a book yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I've tried to convince Jody that we should do 
Um, she doesn't really want to, she was not interested in Ava as much as she was in Olivia. I love yeah. Ava. I, I'm crazy sure. about her. Um, well, and, as, as, and, Lily, uh, as Lily would say, Ava was, a, Ava, Ava was badass. <laughs> her favorite She's word. She's a badass mom. <laughs> right. So Jody and right. I talked about writing another book together. And I think we, we would, or we will, if we can find the right story, um, mm -hmm. the story, there were, particular reasons why it made sense for the two of us to put sure. our our heads sure. together but if we can do it again we will it was well, really, last... it was it was i just would say that the, the it began as a dream yes. literally as a dream and as a result of this dream jody pico who i'd never met became my friend became my collaborator and my co-author and 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 as a result of a single dream it really did Change, changed my life and created this story. And I, uh, it's such a cliche to say this, but it's literally true that pay attention to your dreams, believe in your dreams because they really can change your life. Sometimes they come true. That's right. They do indeed. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Jenny, we could go on all night, I'm sure. But unfortunately we have reached the end of our time uh, we, uh, I can't tell you how, how lucky we are to have you here in Maine and to have you uh, telling these kinds of stories. I, it's just been such a pleasure reading the book, getting to know you, and uh, can't wait to see what comes next. So thank you. Well, Bill, you are such a, you're so kind to say that. You are such a gift to readers in Maine for your many years as a columnist and now in bringing uh, the book club to us and all the work you're doing uh, to um, help support journalism and main writers so um it's an honor for me to be with you as well and uh back at you i i it okay was, this was really fun all right it was i enjoyed it tremendously thank you very much thank Thanks, you uh, jennifer finney finney boiling one of uh, a main treasure thank you so much uh that's that's the end of our session tonight uh we very much appreciate uh your joining us we want to thank our sponsors again bull moose and coffee by design for being involved in this series. And looking ahead, our June book club selection is going to be The Mid Coast by Adam White. That will take place on Thursday, June 22nd at seven o'clock. For now, uh, we thank you for joining us. I'm Bill Nemitz and have a great rest of your evening. Good night.